Hi, I'm Les Carlson, and this is a two-part show with Die Happy. And of course, you know my voice. There it is. You, you've recognized it, and it's got that rasp and stuff. But I want the guys from the group to speak their names and say hello so you'll recognize who's talking on these shows. This is part one of Die Happy. So first. Hello, uh, this is Doug Thiem. Hi, Doug. Glenn Man Caruso. That's right. And Larry Farkas. And we're together. Frontline Rewind. So, and this is a, this is a song called Break Every Chain. And you know who can do that, right? There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. To break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. To break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. Yeah, there is power in the name of Jesus. Oh yeah, there is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain.
us Break every chain Break every chain Break every chain So have you guys known each other for decades? 86 is when I first met So it would be decades Both these guys uh -huh. yeah. yeah, me and Larry go back to high school <clears throat> together so Yeah, back they're further in the 80s. And what was that like? Were you playing instruments in high school? Yeah. It started like the sophomore year. It kind of really actually kind of started. And the first band uh, gig that we ever did, I ever did actually, was Doug and I did at a, a high school party that we didn't know what we were doing. And not that we do now necessarily any more than that, but um, yeah, it was... It was awesome, you know, because we'd always used to talk about that, about wanting to, you know, every kid that you do when you're in high yeah, school, your friends, oh, yeah, I want to record records and be in a band, let's go do this one. Never really probably thought that that was going to happen, because you never really know, but thank God, unfortunately, we are able to, you know, do it with a few bands and get a chance to record and yeah. see some of the world and stuff, so it's been awesome and meet so many great people and... And to see the effect that it's had after so many years has really been the amazing thing. Because when you're in the middle of doing all that stuff, you're not, you know, you're just, you're just a vessel. You're just being used to yeah. do it. And then years later, you hear this from people and stuff, especially like Facebook and all that stuff. Come, oh my gosh! Wow, this is awesome. You had, it, you had a lot of impact. Oh wow! A lot of I, never impact. I know that my son really liked you guys. Really? Wow. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. He's, I think he got all your stuff. So he wow. liked Vengeance Rising, and then he liked. Die Happy. So. Oh, cool. Oh, that's cool to hear. Yeah, so, so Vengeance Rising was the first, uh, I guess, the first. Well, release, it was. You know, it was like a public kind of here we are, this is the band, and you've got yeah. a record deal. It was really Vengeance. Um, vengeance. But then we had to add the Rising. And what was the name of the album? Vengeance Human Rising. Huh? Human Sacrifice. Oh, Human Sacrifice, that's yes. right. Oh, yes. Vengeance Rising was the band, Human Sacrifice was the first record. <laughs> Sanctuary through a friend of, that went to school with us as well, um, 
Robbie Wolf, who was the original singer for Holy Soldier. And Robbie was the one kind of bringing me in, and I got in with Holy Soldier. And then through that time with Doug, with his situation where he was at with his home, he ended up coming to stay over at my house for a while. So we were roommates there for a while, and he started coming to church finally, and uh, met up with Roger Martin, and then him and Roger started jamming with Glenn Rogers. And at the time I was with Deliverance, and it just kind of one thing, we always, like I said, back in high school, we did that one show, and we always wanted to play together, and, and it just it just kind of worked out as we were going to church together. We actually started out kind of as a celebration band for Sanctuary early mm -hmm. on, we didn't even realize. Me and Doug were roommates, we were living at the, they called the Sanctuary House. Bob Beeman had a house, we had the Sanctuary House, there was probably three or four other guys living, roommates there, and stuff like that, and <clears throat> so... They came to me. You guys were originally working with Mike Betts yep. from Night and Neon Cross, original drummer. And then I remember you, Roger, Larry, came in my room. Like Roger's like, hey, man, I want to see if you want to play this stuff. You know, it's Roger Martin. Yeah. Mark Martin is... Roger Martin? Martin. Yeah, he's the bass player. Okay. Yeah. So um, so these guys came. They had acoustic guitars, and they're like, they're like playing... Which was essentially like the, maybe the first four or five songs on the on the first Regents record, mm -hmm. wow. and I'm just pounding out on my knees, like yeah, I wasn't into that music at all. I mean, I was I come from you know I was a big pop music fan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was a big Bonzo fan. You know, mm -hmm. Deep Purple and stuff like yeah. that, and they were too. But um, then there was the Vision, like Larry said. You know, and Bob Beeman was really involved and really getting this out there to, you know, um, this type of music out to the, the fans that would like Slayer and, you know, Testament and all these other bands. So I kind of just said, well, I was the 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 um, a temporary drummer. And so I'll do it for now until you guys find somebody. Mm -hmm. So we started jamming and, you know, and, and I said, well, you know, you guys, you guys look for something else. And I guess they looked for somebody else. They tried a couple other guys. And, yeah. And, yeah. You know, so I was the temporary drummer the whole time. Wow. Yeah. But there was a, <clears throat> there was a real sense that, that there was a lot, of, a lot of metal kids at that time. Oh, yeah. A lot of metal, metal kids. And a lot of it was demonic type stuff. Mm -hmm. right. so, you know, all about hell and demons right, and right. this and that. And so Bob Beeman was... He was going, hey, we got to get some Christian brothers mm -hmm. come in here and represent. Right? Absolutely. Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and now where was Roger Martinez? Was he one of the sanctuary guys? Or well, he was a he was the pastor of the Hollywood Sanctuary Church. We were in the South Bay, and um, we are always starting. To, we, we we are rehearsing, and we we're looking for somebody to sing. So the four of us were, you know, kind of getting the songs down. Um, I, I mean, I really had to get my chops up because I didn't play that style of music before, so it was it was a little difficult for me at first. You know? Yeah, uh, it was a workout. Uh, I don't know who suggested Roger, anyways, but somebody had suggested Roger. We were already like maybe four months into it. Well, word got on that we were just looking for somebody to sing that style yeah. of music, and Roger knew what the style of music was and what it would sound like and should sound like. And it was so hard to find an actual singer like right. yourself to come in. That when Roger came in, it was the most disgusting thing we ever we realized. Laughed. And we realized we, we that oh, laughed. this is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> this is it was so perfect. disgusting that it was perfect. We, <laughs> yeah, we, we were just rolling after, after the first well, song. We were just rolling on the ground because it was like, but it this worked is so well, and his tone worked for yeah. it. It just it just was yeah. the right thing. I still to this day, there's nobody more perfect for what we did than, what, than having Roger. I know that we played a gig. Together, it was at the bicycle rink, the oh, velodrome. Yeah. I'm in blood good. Yes. These guys are vengeance rising. Yeah. And it was, uh, I wore bike pants that day because we were in a bike thing. It was real. It was appropriate. <laughs> it was, it was, right? I'm kind of crazy that way. Mm. And, I huh? thought, and I thought Roger uh, Martinez really knew the word of God. Mm. I mean, you know, he really, really spoke. He did. He, he was very... I remember uh, playing some shows and seeing people respond to our music initially who were just secular, we're just playing a show with opening up for like TSOL and stuff like that. Yeah. And their fans were sitting there watching us like, oh, pretty cool. And then all of a sudden, Roger would come out in this very, very demonstrative, up-in-your-face tone about the gospel. Yeah. 
And it changed everything. You saw people literally change, the expression on their face change where they're, oh, they're a Christian man? What, what's the, and questions abound and, and it created such a rift that it, it worked really well. Yeah. And he was so uh, just dominant person on stage and, and he knew the word of God and he could discuss it and, and talk it with anybody afterwards. Yeah. He had the gift. Very bold amazing. from the stage, which matched the music and what we were doing. Yeah, That's why it was I think great. It was so perfect. You guys were like it was definitely a hundred percent all the way. Even the lyrics, you look at the lyrics, they most sales pulled from the Bible. So yeah, it's it was. No, I, I mean I remember thinking, wow, these guys. I mean, gee whiz, they're so they're so heavy and so forward, and you know. I think that was our first gig, right? The, yeah, the Velodrome. The Velodrome was our first gig. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I yeah, because think... Roger was making up lyrics to some of the yeah, songs. Oh, songs. Oh, yeah, right? because. Mulligan Stew was part of the sun. And that's a pro appropriate if you can make up the words, just throw anything in there. Uh, Mulligan Stew's got about everything in the kitchen. That's right. <laughs> that's <good. laughs> Way to go, Raj. <laughs> took place and and, and uh, you, want, you, want you guys want to explain well that? after the second look, look when we were recording the second record once dead we we were now out we were talking to roger about do you think maybe you can like try to try to sing uh you know i think you tried on one song to not among the dead yeah among the dead not to do the the growl it didn't really work out that well uh it's just, i mean that's fine it's just not him you know what i mean mm -hmm. And we are always talking about how, because of the musical background that we all come from, and we love great vocalists, you know, because a lot of the bands that we listen to all had great vocalists. And we're like, we need, it would be great to do something. We were kind of just done with, you know, the ministry after 
uh, you know, three or four years, uh, not done with the ministry, but done with that. You know, it's like we just felt like God was just moving us on, you know. And Roger wanted to continue with it, which was fine. You know, but we gave him the band, we signed it all over to him and all that stuff. And and then that's when we kind of started working on songs with the... Uh, so it really was a stylistic thing that kind of... Well, that's what I just heard. Uh, you, well, you, actually what stuff. happened was there was just really so much difference between us four and Roger Martinez that um, when we came back after that second tour, there really was a lot of debt that was owed and we had no way to really pay that. There's like $50,000. So that's like five or 10 grand each of us to come up to pay and try to figure out what we're going to do. And with guys with kids and married and mm -hmm. stuff, how, how are we all going to be able to? We were still kind of young, barely yeah. 20 and stuff too, and trying to, you know. Um, so it just came to the point where we thought, well, maybe we should do a few more shows. Because we always did really well with our merchandise sales. Yeah. Well, let's just sell everything. Let's just announce this is yeah. it. We can't, yeah. we have no way to financially continue to, to do this. Yeah. And so when that kind of came, there was some differences on the road between with us and Roger because he was coming up missing a lot of times and would just like show up to gigs and we were just like driving to town and by sound check he can walk in the door and stuff. So there was a lot of already going on in the second tour. There was something was there was a, was a second tour. Yeah, it was also we already knew there was you know something yeah. wasn't right. So when it all kind of came down, uh, oh wait a minute, that's part of the lyrics, isn't it? <laughs> but oh, yeah. um, it just got to the point where we realized we can't do this. We don't have no financing, no way to, to really continue to push with this band because it was just so difficult. Nobody was doing what we were doing. There wasn't a lot of support, whether it was uh, Christians or non-Christians. We weren't getting that much support because people just thought we were demonic from our style of music anyway in Roger's voice. So it made it hard as a whole. But at the end of it, Roger wanted to continue. He felt he still saw you know, the ministry and wanted to continue on with the band. And we just wanted to just say, you know what, let's just do some shows, pay off what we can, and just resume the debt and just move on. But he wanted to continue on, so he got everything. We signed everything over to him. Everything went to Roger. Yeah. And then it all kind of imploded on him, and then it was all our fault, and he hated us for the, all that stuff. But And it's just a big situation there. But don't like I said, we, we, we had all, which is, you know. You don't have to sugarcoat this. <laughs> <laughs> not not these days. I mean, yeah, everybody. Yeah, I mean, why? did you guys lift the toilet seat on the tour? I mean, yeah, you, yeah. you know, I mean, did you do the right things? Right. Well, you know, no, you, no, no, okay. no, not at all. Because this is meaningful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just, it just, um, so as we did that split, fortunately because of us, stuff, yeah. the, 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 the good connection that the four of us had is, is why we realized, let's see, let's see if there's anything yeah. else because we wanted to try it. We had another singer slated to sing the first record um, and it didn't work out. And so um, I knew Robin from... We all went to the same church and we worked on a, a Sanctuary Praise record together. So I played it for uh, the rest of the guys, uh, Doug, Larry, and Roger, Roger Dale. And they dug his voice because, you know, he's a great vocalist. So he came in and I'll let Doug finish the story. So yeah, so he, uh, Robin came <clears throat> in the studio and we had pretty much the whole album written at that point. Uh, uh, actually on tape and ready to go. We were ready to drop vocals on. And uh, I had heard that Robin could sound similar to a, uh, a Paul Rogers and a uh, Ian, Ian Gillen. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to kind of push the boundaries of his limitations. And so I kind of coached him in a way I wanted him to sing the Renaissance. And uh, after hearing what he could do and his abilities, I had to rewrite the whole album. So this one song changed the, the theme for the whole wow. rest of the <laughs> So, he's got a great voice. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah, amazing singer. So, this is Renaissance.
music you hear on Frontline Rewind episodes is available on iTunes, Amazon, Spotify, and our own website, FrontlineRecords.us. Now, Roger, is he the guy with the long, straight, blonde hair? Yeah. We call him Roger Dale. And that was the first time I saw you guys, and I was thinking, when they tour, they must take a, like a chiropractor with them. Windmills. Whipping. Yeah, yeah. whipping. Whipping around. Yeah. And especially Roger had that, whoo. And uh, yeah, I was impressed. I liked it. <laughs> it was I liked a lot of fun. I liked sure. your energy. I just got to tell you, dude. I really, I've got this picture of you and that long blonde hair just swirling around, just <laughs> playing some. Well, that's amazing. Yeah, that how, long blonde hair has been gone. <laughs> I know, but how's your neck? You still got that? Yeah. Last time I talked to my barber, he said, "I said I want to grow my hair out." And he said, "Dude, give it up. <laughs> it ain't gonna happen." <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, the hair's gone, but the spirit's still there. Yeah. yeah, good. It's great to see you. Thank you. Good to see you, Les. Good to see you other guys. You know, I remember when you went down the Waters Club. I was a big fan of Blood Good, the first album especially. And uh, and so, you know, kind of we were doing the same thing at the same time. And uh, I do remember when you went to, uh, down to uh, our territory, down to Waters Club. And it was a really good show. I enjoyed it. Thank you. I think I swam across the crowd that night. Because the uh, PA broke down or something? Yeah, I think you were, you know, crowd surfing there and everybody yeah. was grabbing your butt. I was like, yeah, oh, no. I was thinking, wait a minute, that's so I hated that. Let I'm go. sorry about that. <laughs> as long as it wasn't you. Robin. Yeah. Okay. Now, where are you? Yeah, I'm in Idaho. Oh, you're in Idaho? Yeah. So are you the guy that sang on the first Die Happy album? Or the, yes. Okay. If you, if you could call it singing, yes, that was me. Yeah, well, I thought it was great, man. I was, <laughs> I was going, wow, this guy's cool. He's got a, some really, you hit a few notes there that are, I don't even know if they're on the piano. No, they are. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're high up there, but yeah. Yeah, but not only that, you, uh, you have a, a really great style. Thank you. And then you just sounded great with that band. So it's a fun band to be in. Yeah. Yeah, by the second record, I finally got to join. So that was kind of cool. I loved Renaissance because I got to scream right off the bat. That was really cool. <laughs> anytime, <laughs> you can start, anytime you can start start a song in the fourth octave, it's, it's, it's yeah. a good thing for, for an Ian Gillen fan. So you're already, you're already, <laughs> you've already no. shown everybody what, how high you can go. And here I am, yeah. let's get into this meat of the Yeah, team. it was just, you know, there was so much about that record. I love the energy of it. Um, what's the riff that's like, da 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 Perpetual na, na, motion. Na. Oh, that's it. Perpetual motion. Um, that one was like, um, you know what that was? That was flipping Stevie Ray Vaughan. Okay, I've sped up. If you think about the bass line, I wanted that thing to march. Perpetual motion, just the whole name of the song, and I wanted to march it. And what it is, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan's song, that pride and joy. We did it real fast. We sped that thing up. And that was when it comes to perpetual motion, that was my whole thing. That's what I was listening. I want that flipping. I want it to sound like a garbage can, a warped garbage can rolling down the street real fast. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. That was perpetual motion.
Bone, bone Doctor. Doctor. <laughs> Doug will elaborate on Bone Doctor for you because he wrote the lyrics, but it was I was having issues with my back and was like couldn't move and um, so we just kind of made a little joke thing out of it. We had the song that was kind of influenced, had like a punk influence, kind of like crucified, you know, another great uh, band and friends of ours that we love and um, so that kind of had come from that influence from the crucified with a little bit of a punk flavor to the tune but Doug took the lyrics and kind of made a joke out of my issue that I was having with my back at the time. Yeah so, so basically Larry needed a chiropractor mm -hmm. but he referred to him as a bone doctor. He needs somebody to work on his bones. Okay. And so bones. it just stuck with me and I go well, I need to write a song about this so the whole song basically takes place with Larry uh, needing to call a chiropractor really bad, looks in the phone book, finds a Mr. Bones, he comes over and uh, does a flying berry kick to his back, which is a whole other story. And, it's uh, a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're going to get to that other story. Just a second. This is Guy Happy with Bone Doctor. Records.us, we have all kinds of goodies. Artist bios, links to all the music, and a free music offering when you sign up for the newsletter. Check it out. Frontlinerecords.us. Uh, what else we got on the first album there? Uh, Real? Real. Now here's the flipping thing. I want you, I want everybody to flipping know this. We wrote Real before Metallica wrote Inner Sandman. I, I tell you what, here's the thing. This proves the theory that songs just kind of float through the air. 
songwriters say, man, they're out there. You just got to grab them. Well, flipping Doug grabbed this tune before Metallica did. He grabbed it through the air, and we flipping recorded it before they even came out with it. So that was real. Um, uh, th th no, that, that's the whole thing. It, it really was our song, Screw Everybody. It was our song. How does real go? How's it go? Uh, we got it live in the studio. <laughs>
uh, for real, the lyric content was uh, based upon the fact we were writing the album down in Los Alamitos or Costa Mesa, and I was driving back up Beach Boulevard in Buena Park at 2 or 3 in the morning, and there's prostitutes lined up and down the road. And I'm just driving home from the studio every night, and I'm seeing people get in the cars with these strangers and go off, and it just affected me. And then especially it was during the same time that uh, Magic Johnson revealed that he had AIDS or HIV positive. Yeah. And uh, so it was a huge impact with Z disease and sexual uh, diseases. And now this one seemed like this is, this is a game-changing disease that's killing people now. Mm -hmm. And I felt that like something's happening now and something's changed. The, the, the sexual perversion is now having a stiffer price for what's happening. And that's what that song was written about. What song did I like for Die Happy? Oh, my favorite was Celebration for sure. Um, uh, Celebration was, that was the song that I, that, a lot of Die Happy was stuff that we wanted to do. I wanted to do a song like Celebration. Man, it started off acoustic. It was, it was smooth. It was soft. It was swinging. Um, uh, as far as the song, the song was about Doug's wedding, okay? And we were all there. And the stuff that he that he was talking about, see, for me, I, I lived through that because I lived with the dang guy, okay? And his puppy love and then his full-blown love and then all of it. And then when we were at the, at the wedding, I saw all that. You should have seen Gene, Gina's dad. He flipping looked like somebody who shot him up with a dose of heroin. He was like... I was huge, and it was like, what the heck's wrong with him? He was giving away his daughter to Doug Thing. And I'm like going, oh, man, I would be doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yes, so, uh, Doug. So, yeah, so this song was written around getting married because that was what's happened in my life at that point in time. And uh, uh, marriage changes your life forever. It, you're never quite the same. It's, mm -hmm. it's a whole new um, adventure, so to speak. And so kind of wrote that song around that uh, state of mind and uh it actually got some acclaim in the sense that uh, uh the dove awards picked it up and uh we were acknowledged as it was a songwriting award for that song in the heavy metal category and we played it uh rob and i went over there and played it at live at the dove awards at a artist showcase oh awesome so fun song to write uh and uh well introduce it for us so you're going to listen to Celebration. All right. Ooh, ooh, ooh.
Be sure to check out Frontline Records' YouTube channel for exclusive live performances recorded right here on our Frontline Rewind shows. Doug wrote this song called Melrose. That's about in Hollywood. I'll tell you about when, when he when I looked at that song Melrose, I remembered one time my brother came out here, my little brother. I said, let's go to Hollywood. Let's go to Hollywood. OK, so we went up there. We went on Melrose. And Melrose is flipping. It's like dark Vader, satanic. You know, it's everything. You get on Melrose. And one time we went in this store and we both just we went, walked in about five steps and then we just kind of both backtracked out of the place. I mean, this stunt, how hell it said, it was just, it was just like full on walking into hell.
Hey guys, it, it really has been awesome. A wonderful, wonderful time for, for me and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, so this ends this, uh, this episode of uh, Frontline Rewind with Die Happy. And remember, there, the, this, is, uh, this Die Happy episodes are in, in uh, two parts. So uh, this is the first one. Look forward to the second one. Uh, make sure you get them both because they, they kind of run together. You know what I'm saying? It happened in one day and it was awesome and uh, glad you enjoyed it. Thank <laughs> you.